Breast cancer has been a health challenge for many women. But did you know that breast cancer disproportionately affects African-American women? Welcome to the Empowerment Zone with Ramona Houston, where we zone in on black and brown relations and our journey to empowering our communities. Like many other health disparities, our society and the African-American community must begin to build awareness and foster engagement in order to address this public health challenge. If you want to better understand the issues regarding breast cancer among African-American women, be an advocate in your community, or point a loved one family, or friends suffering from this disease in the right direction, join me in my conversation with Ricky Fairley. As a stage 3A triple negative breast cancer survivor and thriver, Ricky's personal purpose, passion, mission, ministry, and blessing is to bring focus, attention, research, and action to eradicating Black breast cancer. Welcome to the Empowerment Zone, Ricky. I'm so happy to be here. It's so great to be with you, Ramona. It's been so long and it's like I need you in my life. <laughs> I need you in my life too, Ricky. I really, really love you to death. I, I love your personality. I love your spirit. And it's always, always such a pleasure uh, to see you and be in your presence. And my daddy absolutely loved you as well. I loved your dad. He was just the sweetest <laughs> thing. You know it. Oh my gosh. Such a character, right? <laughs> yes, yes. I know you miss him. I know. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So um, before we get into your topic, um, could you tell our audience uh, a little bit about yourself? Um, your topic that you're going to discuss today is um, Black Breast Cancer Awareness Action and your organization, Touch BBCA, which BBCA stands for Black Breast cancer awareness i mean alliance so yep. te tell us a little bit about yourself your background personal and professional and how did you arrive at the moment where you found it uh touch bbca so Marla, you know i am now living my purpose you know we met so many years ago and my i have a you know 35 career in marketing career, you know, 35 year career in marketing but um you know, I had got breast cancer and um, it kind of stopped my life. And I started a new one. I kind of quit my life and started a new one. Um, I had triple negative breast cancer, which um, is a subtype of breast cancer, which affects um, black women at three times the rate of white women. So about 30% of black women with breast cancer have triple negative. It has the highest mortality rate. It's the most aggressive. And it's the only breast cancer subtype that doesn't have a drug to prevent recurrence. So you may hear women saying, I have to take something for five years. I'm taking tamoxifen. We don't have a drug. And we're getting it at earlier ages and at later stages, and we're dying. And the black breast cancer right now is actually the most fatal disease for black women versus white women. So more black women die of heart disease, but relative to white women, breast cancer is the biggest killer. And why is that? You know, it's, um, we have a 42% higher mortality rate. We have um, black women like me who've had breast cancer. We have a 71% higher risk of death than white women. Um, we have a 39% higher recurrence rate than white women. And one of the worst facts is black women under the age of 35 actually get breast cancer at twice the rate and die at three times the rate, well before they would have had that first mammogram at age 40. And so it's a devastating disease. Um, I had, you know, I was diagnosed originally as stage 3A. I had a double mastectomy. I had, you know, did, did the standard of care chemo, six rounds of chemo. I had um, radiation and um, a year to the day my cancer came back. My doctor gave me two years to live. And I said, no, I can't die right now. Haley was a, a sophomore at Dartmouth. I said, I got to put my kids to school. I got to pay tuition. You got me, you and God need to work this out. What have you got for me? <laughs> mm -hmm. I found a specialist from the Triple Negative Breast Cancer Foundation. And um, she put me on two drugs at the time that were experimental for triple negative. And here I am 10 years later. 
So I just celebrated 10 years and um, I know that God left me here to do this work as an advocate. Wow, Ricky, what an incredible story. Uh, um, and also, uh, thank you so much for sharing those uh, vital statistics that many of us are very much unaware of and how uh, uh, breast cancer disproportionately affects Black women. Um, now, you talked about you know, your career as a marketing expert, and then you got breast cancer breast cancer, and then you said you quit your life. Can you uh, kind of, because I'm sure that <laughs> peaked several of my listeners' ears. I'm curious, what did you mean? So I changed everything about my life, and, and I was the breadwinner for my family. I was the rainmaker for my ad agency, which is how you and I met. I was the one bringing in the business, doing the business, and um, I was a, you know, a crazy businesswoman, you know, partner in an ad agency in Atlanta, and um, I was taking care of everybody. And I had to learn that um, I couldn't take care of everybody. So my first meeting with my, um, my nurse navigator, they kind of give you this nurse navigator helps guide your care. She said, Ricky, you are so stressed out. You are just stressed. You need to get the stress out of your life. And I said, I don't believe in stress. Stress is for wimps. It's a cop out. What am I going to do? Not feed the kid. And I was yelling at her, you know, not feed mm -hmm. the kid, not go to work. Like, I don't have time for stress. How do I know I'm stressed? And she said, well, how many times a day do you either think or say the word asshole? I hope I can them. <laughs> and so in my, so in my head, I mean, I, I never really said out loud, but in my head, mm. that was my name for both my business partner of 10 years and my husband of 30 years. Mm. And usually with a lot of adjectives, some that begin with it. And so <laughs> all day long, I called them. That was the word I called them. And I realized that they were also cancers in my life. And so not only did I have to get rid of the cancer in my body, I had to get rid of the cancers in my life. And I had to learn that my peace is non-negotiable. Mm. And so is yours. And don't wait till you get sick to find that. Your peace is non-negotiable. And so I divorced my wife's been a 30 years out. I quit my business partners. I started my own company between my third and fourth rounds of chemo. I sold my big house in Alpharetta, you know, with a pool and on two acres and moved to the beach. And I moved to, I live in a little one bedroom condo on the Chesapeake Bay in the area where I grew up. And I go paddle boarding as much as I can, but I changed everything about my life because I had to find peace. And I know that my breast cancer was really stress related and I had to get rid of the stress. And I was wondering if you came to that conclusion because there are some, um, theories out there that cancer can be developed one one of the one of the causes of cancer is stress and it just manifests as cancer in our bodies so um you believe I'm that the poster child I'm the poster child for that mm -hmm. I'm the poster child I mean I was pretty healthy you knew me I used mm -hmm. to you know ride my bike 20 miles every day and like um I you know I don't always eat super healthy, but you know, I do eat uh, ice cream, but, but I, I was pretty healthy when I got sick. Breast cancer does not care. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly there are some risk factors for cancer that are health related. You know, you don't, you don't want uh, obesity and high blood pressure, all those things that you don't want, but, and you can take care of yourself, but breast cancer doesn't really care, does not discriminate and really doesn't care for black women. They just, it just attacks us and you can't prevent it, but you can early detect it. That's mm. our only protection. And so it's so important to get screens, to know your body, to know your breast and to talk about breast health at an early age. Um, we also don't know about even hereditary factors. Now about 5% of breast cancer is hereditary. Like there's a gene called the BRCA gene, but it's only 5% of the population. Um, but for black women, we don't really know. We don't really know. And, and even for triple negative, so many black women are getting triple negative there's gotta be some science that, that we just haven't uncovered yet. So you need to talk to your mom and talk to your grandma and know your, her story so that you can be ready for this, but also get screened on your bodies. We have, um, we have a great um, HBCU internship. And this year I've had 15 interns work for me over the year and all from all different schools. Um, um, Atlanta's well represented with Spelman. Um, um, but um you know, these girls, what we try to teach them is, you know, learn, talk about breast health. And we ask, they do a social media campaign on their Instagram and their TikTok. 
and uh, make videos about how to do a brow set because I'm on TikTok. Mm-hmm. It's pretty funny. Um, but they, um, we asked them to make a video with their mom and their best friend at the beginning of the internship. And in every situation for all 15 girls, it's the first conversation they've ever had with their moms or their wow. best friend about breasts. Wow. And they're all, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21. And so we're not talking about it, but you know, black people, we don't talk about disease at the kitchen table. We just mm-hmm. don't. It's all these secrets and hidden and, mm-hmm. oh yeah, grandma mm-hmm. Pookie has the sugar, mm-hmm. but you talk about it when somebody either is dying or sick or dead. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I want to encourage those conversations at a young age, because what's happening with a lot of young women, Ramona, is they will get a lump. They'll feel something weird. They'll go to the doctor and the doctor will dismiss them. Oh, you're too young for a mammogram. Don't worry. It's just, it'll come back in six months. And guess what? Six months later, they're either, either metastatic or dead, right? Mm. So it's so important for our young women to stand in front of the mirror, look at your boobs, feel them, know them. You know, these are my little, these are my little fake half million dollar boobs, I call them. <laughs> but, um, but know your body so that if, that's, if something does feel unusual or look unusual, you can, you can go advocate for yourself at a doctor's office. Great advice to begin having these conversations very early and having them with your mothers, with your cousins, your aunts, your sisters, uh, your best friends, uh, in order to educate people and inform people about breast breast cancer. I'm uh, very excited to hear about the internship you have uh, with, yeah. with, with, with your young people. And I, I know that caught some of my listeners' ears. Can uh, you expand on what that internship is about and what students would need to do in, if they wanted to apply for your internship? What, yeah. what is it that they're doing first of all? Yeah. So it's a social media internship. And actually, so we have, we actually had 15 girls this year. We're trying to double that for next year. Mm-hmm. And, and this year we did 10 week sessions next year. We're going to do 12 week semesters and do a spring and a fall semester. And then we also have some other um, internships all year long. But we basically um, pay pay the kids. I think we, you know, we pay for 10 weeks, we paid $1,500. Mm-hmm. So that'll be this, the equivalent for 12 weeks. And we ask them to post on their social media. We give them a lot of content, which then they either, like manipulate into their own social media. Mm-hmm. They post on Instagram. We ask them to post about three times a week. We ask them to make two videos with their mom and their their best friend or have whatever videos they want to make in these conversations. And, um, and then we... Um, we, we, you know, we have like a, a meeting every other week. We have one of our interns, actually our intern coordinator. Her name is Ariana. She actually had triple negative at age 19 and again at mm. 21. Mm. And she's a great survivor. She's actually 22 now. And um, she just graduated from college and she manages our interns. Um, and then we, but they focus on different areas of their content. So when, one may talk about clinical trials, maybe one may talk about early detection, but we give them kind of areas to pursue in the science. And then they just post and we give them a lot of content. So it's like kind of taking what we think is a good post and turning it into what will be relevant for their audience. Mm-hmm. Um, we ask that they be um, pre-health career. So pre-med, pre-nursing, pre-something we had, you know, we had one like pre-psychiatry um, psychologist intern. So kind of be in the health arena. And um, we, we would prefer to have sophomores and juniors. We have had a couple of seniors and a couple of freshmen, but we find that it's most valuable when they're sophomores and juniors. Um, the seniors are kind of already focused on what they're going to do next. And so, um, and then, you know, I have a web series on the blackdoctor.org Facebook page. And we're on, my show is called The Doctor Is In, and we're on every Wednesday night at six Eastern time. And so we have the interns do an episode on our show and talk about what they've learned. And many of them have gone on to work in some of the pharmaceutical companies that sponsor the internship or get projects or do other things. And so we actually, we, so one, uh, one of our main sponsors is Gilead. We also are sponsored by Amgen and Genentech, and all of them have done other projects for some of those companies and been showcased by those companies because they're such amazing young women. So it's a pretty, you know, you know, I'm a mom of two daughters and my rule was you have to get straight A's or you have to live in another house. Right. So, <laughs> so there's no concept of it being in my house. Right. So I'm all about get straight A's, do your work, do your focus on your schoolwork. That's most important. So this is an extracurricular activity. And, and I, we really focus on, okay, well, who's got a test date? I don't want to hear, I don't want to see you. And so we try to you know, man, man, manage their time so they can be educated. That's what they're there for, but also give them an outlet to learn about breast health. 
That's great. That's and, a great internship. So if yeah. uh, students wanted to apply for that internship, what, where would they go? Email info at touchbbca.org. Great. Info at touch.bbca.org. Yeah, so, not dot, just touchbbca.org. Thank you. And thank we're you. gonna we're, we're taking applications now to start in February. Great, great, great. So that's good. Your deadline is February. So put your application in. So tell us about BBCA and, and the founding of this organization and what is what is what are some of your primary activities? What are you all doing in order to uh, bring about more uh, breast cancer awareness among Af African American women? Yeah, and and you know, um, I love the word word awareness, but a study showed um, a couple of years ago done by the Ad Council that 92% of black women will say they're aware of breast cancer. So everybody mm -hmm. knows about it, right? 25% mm -hmm. um, actually talk about it. 17% mm. act on their risk. Mm. So we have a lot of work to do to, to get people to take an action, okay? Um, so the reason why, or a main reason why so many black women are dying is because our bodies weren't a consideration in the clinical research that was used to develop drugs, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the first drugs that I took were the standard of care drugs that pretty much everyone takes. They didn't work on my body mm -hmm. and they're not working on other lab. So that's why black women are dying at a 42% higher rate. Mm -hmm. So we don't have black women in the science. So why is that? That's because of, you know, the first thing you hear about is Henrietta Lacks, the Silsula mm -hmm. study, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all that. Tuskegee um, experiment, yeah, just exactly. for, for people who know about that, Tuskegee yeah. experiment. Go ahead. Yeah, but that earned medical mistrust. It's earned, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's rightly so. Um, but we need to get over that and know that because of that, now there are a lot of laws in place to protect patients from any of that ever happening, right? Um, and we have to get into the science because until we get drugs that were tested on our Black bodies, we're going to keep dying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we're on a, a mission to start a movement. We're starting a movement right now. Actually, it's starting in a couple of weeks, January 11th. We're launching it with a press press conference to get more black women into clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ramona, I'm a marketing person. I'm not a scientist or a doctor. So when I look at the stuff that's available sort of in the marketing realm, if you want to call it marketing in the health realm, none of the messaging is working. Mm -hmm. Nobody's doing it right. So right now there's only 3% participation in clinical trials hmm. and the pharma companies will tell you, Oh, we're trying to get black women. We can't find them. And then, you know, the research companies that we can't find, but we, you know, we can't find black women. That's crazy. It's because you're not talking to them in the right way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm all about the messaging and what it looks like and how you talk about it to motivate people to change their behavior. That's what I've done my entire career. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to trans translate that into how to talk about clinical trials. So I spent a lot of this year doing a big research study to understand the emotional barriers that black women have to doing clinical trials. Like there are a lot of tactical reasons like the social determinants of health. So transportation, access mm -hmm. to care, mm -hmm. not in the right hospitals. The biggest reason doctors don't ask them to participate in trials, hello. Um, so, but I wanted to understand what's in their psyche, like what's driving them to make these decisions, right? And what I learned was very, very interesting and startling. So the breast community is not one that you want to be in. You know, you, if, you cannot, if you can avoid breast cancer, great. But once you're in this breasty club, it's unconditional love and trust. So a lot of the calls I get from women are, okay, Ricky, the doctor said X, Y, Z, but what do you think? And mm -hmm. if I haven't had that personal experience, I can tear five other women that, that had that side effect. Mm -hmm. Or here are six other women that took that drug. And they want that breasty validation. And so we learned that breasties were telling other breasties, oh, don't do a clinical trial. You're going to get the sugar pill and die. Don't do a <laughs> clinical trial because you're going to be a guinea pig. So the bad messages were coming from our community. And so what I learned was our breasty community just really isn't educated enough to know what they need to know about what a clinical trial is and how it works so they could recommend it to their sisters. And so we're starting a movement. It's starting with them as a target audience, with our breasty community as a target audience. And I've created what I'm calling this breasty choir of a bunch of breast cancer advocates. You know, once you sort of get over breast cancer a little bit, then you want to fight. You want to like right, help right, right. Be a bad, right? <laughs> fight like a girl. So I gathered them. I took all that energy and passion 
And we created this group, this group of women who are now helping me educate other women. But in my research, I learned that um, I could convert somebody from a one, I'll never do a trial to a five, sign me up tomorrow in five minutes. Wow. With the right information coming from me, the breasty or coming mm -hmm. from a breasty, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I have to be the voice of trust, right? But the messages are easy. One of them is um, um, exactly what a clinical trial is. Mm -hmm. You don't get, there's no sugar pill. You get standard of care. That means you get a drug that's either currently on the market that you may have, you may be already taken or a drug that's new and could be good to get better results. But you're always given a drug, right? You're not going to be let down. You're going to have something that already exists or something, new, right? And people just don't understand that basic premise that, that, and if the trial isn't working, if the new drug isn't working, they'll take you back to the other drug. Mm -hmm. You'll never be off of the drug. Do you know what I mean? That you're always going to be taken care of. That also, guess what? When you're in a trial, trials have better outcomes. People have better outcomes. They tend to live longer. The trial, you know, they work because they're getting really, really close attention and care. The mm -hmm. doctors and nurses are all over you. You have more doctor visits. You have more scans. You're more attended to. And so it's a really good session to be. And it's usually, it's free. If it's not free, you shouldn't do that trial mm -hmm. because the, the care is given to free. Um, the other one is, you know, that Advil you took last week for that headache. Well, guess what? It was in a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. That Tylenol you gave your baby was in a clinical trial. People are like, really? Everything on the shelf in the drugstore and CVS or whatever, Walgreens has been in a clinical trial. Okay. So, so it's all been tested. No big deal. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, that chemo that you took or that I took, guess what? It was a clinical trial in your black body because when that drug was developed, there were no black women in that research. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you're already in a clinical trial. It's in, you're doing it now. Right. And then the last one and the most compelling one is do it for your daughter, mm -hmm. do it for your daughter, do it for your granddaughter, do it for your family. Cause you know, we are these powerhouse black women, you know, with the cape on taking care of everybody <laughs> like I was. And we, we, you know, we're the last person on the list that we're going to give a hug to. So give your, you know, do it for somebody else. Do it for somebody that you love. And, you know, my, my purpose is Belle, my oldest granddaughter. She's four. She's going to get boobs in about 10 years. So I've got about 10 years <laughs> to get rid of breast cancer. So she's my purpose. Every day. I talk to her in the morning. Okay, Belle, let's go to work. But, um, but yeah, so I learned that with those simple messages. So we're now starting a movement to help black women understand these basic, basic things. And really, you know, talk to talking to them in language that they understand with things that they are they can relate to, right? Mm -hmm. And we're trying to help the pharma companies do the same thing mm -hmm. and really talk about, you know, how they can do things differently and talk to black women differently. So I work with a bunch of different pharma companies, and one of them who's kind of funding this campaign for us is Genentech, and they're kind of on the forefront of this kind of research. So is Gilead, Amgen, ASI, CGEN. A lot of them are really trying to reach black women, but they're they're listening to me. They're listening to us. Mm -hmm. Help them figure out how to do this differently because they realize it's almost like I'm an alcoholic. I'm doing this wrong, right? Mm -hmm. They have to realize mm -hmm. that what they're doing is not working and we're starting to make that traction. So that's what I do every day. That, you know, you have a, a great point about communication uh, and how you reach our communities. You, you the messages are different for, for each community, right? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. and, and you have to develop a message and meet the people where they are and they develop are. the you message do. that, that, that touches each of uh, each community differently. Yeah. The other thing too, Ramona, not only, not only is it the message, it's the messenger. Yep. It's the messenger, but it's also where you go. Like I want to be, I want to have our message where black women live, work, play and pray. That's it. And, you know, I worked for Coke for, for a while and, and one of the Coke mantras, I, they wanted Coke to be within arm's reach of a consumer. So think about it, Coke's in your refrigerator, it's at the gas station, the grocery store, whatever. I want this message to be everywhere because frankly, why I really want to educate young women, because um, you have to know about a clinical child before you need one. Mm -hmm. yep. And it should be, it should be a kitchen table conversation, just like breast health, just like going to the dentist, like getting a checkup, all the stuff you talk about. It should be something that we know about. So when the, con the concept comes up in a situation where you need it, you're prepared. So that's what we're trying to do. And so uh, when you look at Touch BBCA and the work you've done thus far, what do you feel like are some of your accomplishments and achievements thus far? You're a, a very new organization in your infant stages. So 
this I want to give you some bragging rights. What 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 have you <laughs> what have you accomplished in this short time that you've uh, been in existence? So I think where we've made the most impact. Um, so right be really probably a month before I actually started the foundation, I started this web series. It's called The Doctor Is In. It's on the BlackDoctor.org Facebook page, and you know they are really the biggest black platform on Facebook. They have 2.4 million followers. And, um, and I've known Reggie, the founder for many years, just from my marketing background, you know? And so, so um, I went to him with this idea and he like, let me do it. And he gave me this, this gift of this platform. And my co-host is Dr. Monique Gary. She's a breast surgical oncologist right outside of Philly. And she's just a phenomenal brain and spirit. And um, we are on an hour every Wednesday night and this year we've reached 3 million people. Mm. And, um, and so even Reggie even said, you know, we are really the biggest black, um, biggest breast cancer web series in the world, which is mm. pretty crazy. Um, we had, I think our best show, we had 87,000 views. Wow. We, we normally get about five to 15,000 people a week watching our show. We talk about anything and everything breast cancer. Um, our show next week is going to be um, faith and fear can't live in the same house. Yes, I love and we have a message. bunch of pastors, right? A bunch of pastors coming on, and kind of our spiritual guides. So I'm very proud of the fact that, and you know, a lot of that's due to COVID. Had COVID not have happened, um, we probably would have had some events. We've been to reach out, and you know, maybe get a hundred people, maybe three hundred people at an event. But I can reach fifteen thousand. Yep, every Wednesday. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, so I hate to, you know, maybe one of the benefits. COVID to me had two benefits the virtual reach that we're getting. And I'm sure you're seeing that on your podcast, right? Mm-hmm. But also also the fact that, hello, you know, there are some health disparities in the world mm-hmm. that we've lived mm-hmm. with our whole lives. Mm-hmm. Now mm-hmm. Deal, right? so, mm-hmm. so I'm really proud of our show and what we're doing and how we've been able to really get our message out to a lot, a lot of people and hopefully make a difference in their lives. You know, I'm also proud of our HBCU program. You know, we've had now 15 interns. We hope to have 30 next year. And um, if I could have one at every of all the hundred HBCUs, I would take that, but just reaching these kids and, and I can see the impact on their lives and their families. I got a Christmas present from one of our interns parents the other day, like, well, I don't even know you really, but, um, but, um, but I know that we're making a difference in their lives and their communities. And I feel really, really proud of, proud of that. You know um, I think also just the whole clinical trial conversation and being recognized by pharma, I've been able to raise, really a lot of money to do the work that I want to do and get recognized and be, okay, Ricky, we're going to write you a check. What do you want? Mm-hmm. And I thank God for that every day. I'm so grateful and I don't want to take it for granted at all, but, and I try to spend the money wisely, but because we are getting funded, we are getting support for our ideas and our work and, and um, our movement's going to kick off on January 11th. We have, um, we're doing a big press event um, in, in DC. April Ryan is our co- is our host. And, um, um, I can even read you. So our, our tagline is when we trial mm. and we're looking at it as kind of almost like a political movement mm-hmm. and we're trying to reach women. We're, we're inviting our community partners. So, you know, all the black community organizations, the churches, and really trying to get and put tentacles into the links, the sororities, you know, national council of Negro women, um, even the boule for the men, like everybody needs to have this message. And then we're working with AME Zion church and AME church to really help people be where they are. And it's funny when, you know, you get breast cancer, you most often first go to your pastor. Okay. Pastor pray for me. Right. But then the pastor, what do they do after that? They have nothing, they don't know what to do. So we're making tools for pastors. Mm -hmm. So not only when you, you pray for the patient, but give her this tool that says, here's who you call here are the things you need to ask your doctor and kind of Mm -hmm. direct them to our website so we can give them the information they need. And clinical trials should be part of your treatment decision. It's not a last resort for when you're dying. It's part of, okay, what are my options for treatment? If I, what are the, what's the best chemo available to me? If I have to do chemo, what's the best surgery available to me? And, you know, there's always a debate over whether I should get a a double mastectomy and cut my boobs off or not. And, And kind of the science right now says, that a lumpectomy, so cutting a piece of your boob and doing radiation is equivalent to a double mastectomy, which is what I had. Cut them all mm-hmm. up and get big mm-hmm. ones, right? Or whatever. Um, and the data says they're equivalent, but that mm. data is for white women. Hmm. There were no black women in the study. The study was done in Germany. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, so, so 
I, I really caution everybody when you're talking to your doctor, you know, ask about the black side of it. Like, well, how was it? Was this drug tested on black people? What was what happened with the black patients that took this or did this therapy? And so we're really trying to force those conversations and and get equip black women with information so they can advocate for themselves. This I'm so happy for the impact you are making on the community. And, you know, congratulations on the success of the doctor is in um, the HBCU um, uh, internships, which I know are making an impact in, uh, in really reaching another generation of uh, African-American women. And I'm wishing you the best on this January 11th event, which uh, it definitely uh, will have an impact on, on our community. Um, is, is there any, could you tell our audience how they could get a hold of you on, um, and learn more about B BCA? Um, yes, yeah, sure, for sure. Um, I actually would love to read you my manifesto if I can. Yes, yes, please do. So this is our when we trial manifesto, okay? Historically, when Black women set our minds on solving a problem, we always succeed. Yes. From freeing slaves via an underground railroad to fighting for equality in schools to ensuring the victory of Canada to have our best interests at heart, we don't try, we do. But for years, black women have been dying at alarming rates from a killer hiding in plain sight, breast cancer. Black women are more likely to die from breast cancer than white women, partially because we're not considered when life-saving cancer drugs are being developed. If we wanna change this disturbing reality, we must demand to be included in clinical trials. This is a matter of life and death for black women. And as always, we must count on each other to save ourselves. Eradicating black breast cancer isn't about a month, it's about a movement. When we trial, we set a new standard of care. When we trial, we choose life. When we trial, we do it for our daughters. When we trial, we defy the odds. Love it, Ricky. Love it, so, great manifesto. So, uh, yeah, so our website is um, touchbbca.org. Our social media, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter um, and YouTube is at touch BBCA and anyone can reach me at Ricky at touch BBCA. I answer every email. I answer every phone call. My phone number, our touch phone number is 443-758-1924. I'll say it again, 443-758-1924. If you have, if you're newly diagnosed or you know someone who is, tell them to call us. We'll do our best to be a resource. We try to love on our breasties as much as we can and, and equip them with information that can hopefully save their lives. So it's my purpose. Glad you have embraced your purpose. So speaking of embracing your purpose, Ricky, a lot goes into uh, educating yourself in order to become a professional. And as you stated, you have these internships that are focused on uh, students at HBCUs. And so for all those students out there, what strategy would you give them to ensure that they are successful in college? But before you do that, can you please tell us what college or colleges did you attend? What were your major or majors? And if you graduated, what were your degrees? And then what is that strategy you would provide students to ensure that they're successful in college? Sure, so I went to Dartmouth. I was an English major. And then I went to Kellogg Graduate School of Management at Northwestern and I got my MBA in management policy and marketing. Um, and I, um, I, as, I, as I said earlier, um, I believe in getting straight A's, do your best. And I told my daughters, um, you can have anything you want. They both had cars when they were teenagers. They had all the toys. They had all the clothes, they had everything. But if you get a B, then you need to go live someplace else. <laughs> and so I know that's not possible for everybody, but it's do your best. Do your best, hone your skill, figure out what you're good at. And you know what? And learn how to get help with stuff you're not good at. It's okay to ask for help mm -hmm. um, if you need a tutor or something, but, but do your best, you know? And, and if you think about it, your parents or somebody spending a lot of money on your brain. Don't waste it. Take advantage of it. Use it and make it happen for yourself because not everybody has the opportunity to go to school. Not everybody has the opportunity to be educated. So take advantage of it. Also, you know, 
every every stepping stone can go somewhere you know always like and i i really believe that anybody that you encounter in your life like we met how many years ago i'm like any everybody in you encounter your life is supposed to be in your life god placed them there for a reason and you may not know now but you'll know eventually and figure that out and use those people talk to those people engage with those people because you never know what, what could happen never burn a bridge always stay connected to the people that that are put in your path. Love it, Ricky. Great advice. Several people, per, excuse me, several pieces of advice. Do your best when you need it. Make sure you get help. Take advantage of the opportunity to attend college and embrace your new relationships because you never know where those relationships will go in the future. Yep. I have one more that I yes. about. So I tell this to my daughters. So um, when you're in a situation, when somebody is making a decision about you, you're probably not going to be in the room. Like when, when they're making the mm-hmm. decision to let you into the college, mm-hmm. to get a promotion, to get mm-hmm. a new job, you're not going to be in the room. So what are the three things you want people to say about you mm-hmm. when you are not in that room? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. What are those three things? And, and the way they learn them is how you live. Yep, so live those it. three things. Live those three things. So when people, when you're not there, they'll rattle them off. Yep. Live your values. Live the way you want people to see you. Thank you so much, uh, Ricky. That was great advice. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your information about Touch BBCA. I wish you the best uh, in your endeavors. And please let me know if I can ever be of service and assist you. And uh, please feel free, to, whenever you like, whenever you're launching a program or an initiative, or you just want to reach uh, uh, some more people in your audience and make an even bigger impact, please feel free. You're always to reach out here. You're always welcome on the Empowerment Zone. Thank you so much. I love you so much, girl. And check the breasts that you love. I know you have a pair (laughs) and your peace is (laughs) non-negotiable. Thank you. Thank you so much. A special thank you to the incredible team of the Empowerment Zone. Terry on Gully, theme song. NADWORKS, digital support, and of course, our featured guest. If you enjoyed my podcast, please subscribe. We are on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Be sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts too. Thank you for your continued support.